There was no one on the other end of that phone call, but soon there will be. Welcome to the Dreamatorium. Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the funniest and most iconic moments in one of the most beloved sitcoms around, Parks and Recreation. What I said was, give me all the bacon and eggs you have. Do you understand? Consider this your spoiler alert. Number 20, Andy's Band Names. Spread your wings and learn to fly. Horses don't fly. That's why I'm telling him, learn to fly. Andy's dreams of becoming a famous musician have reaped some unfortunate, if hilarious, results. He and his fellow players named their band Scarecrow Boat and had hopes of making it outside of Pawnee. In just a minute, Scarecrow Boat is gonna rock it out. Please be patient while we rock out the equipment setup. In the show proper, they changed it back to Mouse Rat, but that was far from the only switch up they had in their history. Some of their most hilarious monikers include God Hates Figs, Everything Rhymes With Orange, Puppy Pendulum, Nothing Rhymes With Orange, and Death of a Scam Artist. Andy also tried to have the band carry his name with titles such as The Andy and Andy's and Andy Dwyer Experience. No group needs to go through this many names, but hearing the laundry list of options sure is hysterical. Uh, then we were God Hates Figs, Department of Homeland Obscurity, Flames for Flames, Muscle Confusion. Number 19, Meeting Mona Lisa Saperstein. For the record, would hit it, would hit, would hit, hard pass. <laughs> Tom, who is this person? jean ralphio Saperstein may be the best worst character on the show, depending on your point of view, with iconic one-liners that have made internet history. As it turns out, so is his twin sister. The worst! She's the worst in the world. We first meet Mona Lisa when she's hired by Tom Haverford as an assistant. She proves to be a bad hire as she slacks off tremendously, leaving us in stitches. When Tom plucks up the courage to speak up, she's into it, and the two begin an unlikely relationship. Like her brother, however, her foibles are a source of comic genius. Remember when she and jean Ralphio launch into an improvised Don't Be Suspicious song when the latter fakes his death? What would the internet do without you, Mona Lisa? Did I order the what for the what, 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 what are you even talking about right now? Number 18, Calzone Poisoning. Chris, I'm dying. I was dying earlier today, and then I died. Now I'm dead. There never was a tale of more hysterical woe. Ben Wyatt's obsession with calzones is practically unparalleled, and we're sure they've had many lovely moments together over the years. But like many tragic love stories, theirs ends in blood, sweat, and, well, indigestion. And I cracked the bottom of the toilet bowl. Oh god, don't say that. When he finds a wedding caterer that serves mini calzones, it seems like a dream come true. But the higher you rise, the farther you have to fall. And sure enough, he, Chris, and Ron get food poisoning after consuming them. Only Tom is spared, having chosen not to partake. The whole segment is painful. You can practically sense their suffering, leaving us chuckling through tears. We feel for them, but it's too funny to ignore. The Calzones betrayed me? Never again, guys. As God is my witness, they're dead to me. Number 17, Ron flees from Tammy One. If you're gonna stay here, there are three rules you need to follow. One, no talk about Tammy. One, two, no talk about Ben. Three, no talk. Ron Swanson is a man of sense, order, and foresight. He's prepared for any and all kinds of disasters. So when he finds out that his ex-wife Tammy, the first one, not the second one, has returned, he wastes no time. Whoa, 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 Ron, 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 what's going on? My ex-wife Tammy is back. Yeah, I saw her in the courtyard. No, my other ex-wife, Tammy. <gasps> Tammy won. He pulls Leslie aside, informing her that he's going to use all his accrued 228 personal days to solve this problem. He's not messing around, which makes it all the more humorous. This isn't the last time Ron has trouble with women named Tammy either. Let's not forget that he and Tammy too end up in jail. There's also the drinking contest involving his mom. One thing is for sure, if Ron and Tammy's are involved, it's sure to be a chaotic, entertaining time. Godspeed. Move! Oh. Number 16, Andy's code names. Also, from now on, we'll be using code names. You can address me as Eagle One. Anne, code name, been there, done that. April is currently doing that. Here's a bit that's so amusing, it's become a meme. Clearly, Andy's inventiveness with names extends beyond simple band names. 
A few days after a pie is thrown Leslie's way, Andy, as Burt Macklin, is on the job protecting the city council candidate. Part of his investigation, for some inexplicable but hilarious reason, involves giving the gang code names. These names, however, are not what you would call appropriate, though Andy seems oblivious to that fact as ever. Let's just say that Ben is justifiably relieved to be called Eagle 2. Donna is, it happened once in a dream, Chris, code name, if I had to pick a dude. Ben is Eagle 2. Oh, thank God. Leslie's code name, though? Clearly, Andy takes honesty to a whole new level. It's priceless. I'd be lying if I said I hadn't thought about it. It's in position. Number 15, Gay Penguin Wedding. Pawnee Zoo recently purchased two South African black-footed penguins, Tux and Flipper. And as part of our zoo promotion, we are going to give them a marriage ceremony because they mate for life. Love is love, and no one comes to know that better than Leslie Nope. When promoting the Pawnee Zoo, she accidentally mistakes two male penguins for a male-female pair and officiates their ceremony. I'm sorry? Tux and Flipper are both boys, so you should have pronounced them husband and husband, technically. That's awesome. Overnight, Leslie wins the approval of Pawnee's queer community. Unfortunately, anti-LGBTQIA plus organizations are less than approving. Eventually, she gets sick of the homophobia and stands by the nuptials. She even ends up driving the penguins to a zoo in Iowa where gay marriage is legal. The core social premise here isn't anything to laugh at, but the penguin plot of it all amps up the comedy. Indeed, it's so nonsensical and absurd, you can't help but giggle. We love an ally, even an accidental one. Oh look, Six Flags! I should take them on a water slide! They might die, but it would be so cute! Number 14, Burt Macklin and Janet Snakehole. Think about it as role-playing. That makes it sexy. That could be fun. <laughs> Andy and April make for the most entertaining power couple. Granted, they come up with these playful personas individually at different points earlier in the series, but it isn't until the fight where they truly come to marvelous life together. Hello, strange person who I have never met before. Who are you? I'm Janet Snakehole. April's Janet Snakehole is a very rich, very fancy woman, but she isn't innocent in this life. Andy's Burt Macklin, meanwhile, was an FBI agent framed for presidential ruby theft. To say they commit to the bit is an understatement. Honestly, we forget these are alter egos and not real people. If all the world's a stage, Andy and April make for the most hilarious role players. Freeze! No. FBI! No! Leave me alone! Hands in the air! I didn't kill anybody, and I didn't burn down the mill either. My sister did, but now she's been eaten by wolves! <laughs> Number 13, Ron pulls his tooth. Here's Tom. Please bring silverware. Please bring cooked steak. This is ridiculous. We've already discussed how Ron Swanson is a man's man who means business. He also gives his co-workers valuable lessons, namely showing them they can't mess with him, often in ways that have us gasping for air. During a meeting, he notes that his tooth is hurting him. You okay, Ron? Just a little tooth pain. I'm fine. Continue. But come on, he doesn't like dentists, so why would he trust one to fix it? Instead, he decides to pull it out himself. His swift dispatch causes Tom to faint and many of his colleagues to flee in disgust. Relatable. Of course, the real gag is that Ron only pretended to pull his tooth out. It's the lesson that counts. Never has a man's display of fortitude been more uproarious. Dentist pulled the tooth out yesterday. But it's always a good idea to demonstrate to your co-workers that you are capable of withstanding a tremendous amount of pain. Number 12, Ben's Claymation. Check this out. I'm teaching myself how to do claymation videos. Isn't this just so cool? <laughs> it is so cool. Ben is massively depressed. Ben's unemployment stint leads him down some dark but ultimately hilarious paths. In a spiral, he turns to claymation. Though Chris may be worried, Ben is adamant that he is not depressed. I've known you a long time, and right now you need help. With my claymation? With your life. His frenzied expression trying to convince us he's okay while showing off his little clay dude is something you have to see to believe. He eventually gets a serious reality check when he realizes how short the project, Requiem for a Tuesday, actually is, but we digress. Ben's creative side knows no bounds, as just two seasons later he comes up with the cones of Dunshire game. This endeavor ends up being more fruitful, but the claymation moment lives in our heads rent-free. And somewhat ironically, it cheers us up daily. No, 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 I'm not. You see, in my head, I thought that was really, really cool. 
In fact, I, I, I emailed Leslie two days ago and I compared it to Avatar, Chris. Number 11, Ron on Pawnee Today. Hi, my Yorkshire Terrier has chewed up the legs on my kitchen table. Is there a cheap way to repair that? Great question. Is there anything our man Ron can't do? When Leslie is unable to be on Pawnee Today to promote a fundraiser, he volunteers to fill in for her. He can, after all, speak in full sentences and not cry. Since host Joan becomes rather indisposed, Mr. Swanson once again saves the day with his no-nonsense straight talk and ineffable Ronness. Now I will take your calls, apparently. Yes. Hey, Joan, settle a bet for me. Who's the sexiest couple in history? Are Pats and Case do, or Bieber? The ensuing show, You're On With Ron, proves that he could and would make the most hilarious host in another life. He takes people's calls, gives honest advice, and, above all, promotes the gala. It's impossible for us to keep a straight face as it unfolds, especially because of his deadpan style. What a trooper. I've seen three movies in my life. Bridge on the River Kwai, Patton, and Herbie Fully Loaded. My girlfriend's kids love it. It's pretty funny. Next caller. Number 10. Leslie has network connectivity issues. Is she, is she sick? Are you sick? No. Yeah, she's sick. That's why I'm wearing this and misting myself with hand sanitizer. How can something as simple and seemingly not funny at all as the flu lead to such comic hilarity? Although Leslie gets the flu, this doesn't stop her from trying to perform her duties. With her so insistent on working, Andy tries to look up her symptoms, and his conclusion is unbeatable. Leslie, I, I typed your symptoms into the thing up here, and it says you could have network connectivity problems. We still burst out laughing whenever we see the scene. It turns out that Chris Pratt improvised this line, which makes it all the more impressive. It's nothing fancy, just pure, unfiltered comedic gold, and exactly the kind of ridiculous thing Andy would say. We're thrilled it was left in the final product. And I would counter with my own question, which is, why is half of your face all swirly? Okay. Number nine, the coffee machine. So, who broke it? I'm not mad, I just want to know. This iconic cold open has become a beloved and oft-referenced Parks and Rec staple, and for good reason. It features another one of Ron's lessons. He begins by asking his co-workers who broke the coffee machine. As Leslie tries to say it was her and others shift blame, the scene dissolves into chaos. It is, however, all going according to Ron's maniacal but hysterical plan. You see, he was the one who broke it and jumped at the chance to throw a wrench in the office camaraderie. I broke it. I burned my hand, so I punched it. We're dead. The case of the coffee machine showcases everyone's comic talents and personalities, and we achieve maximum hilarity. I predict 10 minutes from now, they'll be at each other's throats with war paint on their faces and a pig head on a stick. Number eight, Tom's food list. Have a food rule number six, never eat anything with the sauce I have to dip myself. Drizzle it on for me. I'm not your maid. If Tom Haverford's personality were boiled down to one word, it would be eccentric. Pessimists see the glass as half empty, Optimists see it as half full, and Tom just wonders why it contains boring old water instead of super water. Forever young, I wanna be forever young. Do you really wanna live forever? These bursts of eccentricity are not uncommon for Tom, but here we're given a special treat with a long cut of goofy names he gives food. The glow in his eyes as he informs the audience of each quote-unquote brilliant nickname is utterly priceless. It's a wonderful display of comedy, making us giggle at every turn. Zerts are what I call desserts. Tray trays are entrees. I call sandwiches Sammy's, Sanduzzles, or Adam Sandler's. Air conditioners are cool blasters with a Z. I don't know where that came from. I call cakes big old cookies. Number seven, elderly sex ed. I have an idea. Let's pretend that we're old people and we can ask Anne our grossest, most perverted sex questions. Parks and Recreation knows how to be sentimental one moment and dive into the finer points of intercourse for elderly folk the next. As this scene makes evident, senior citizen intimacy is a very real thing. Are these old people really having sex with each other? Yeah, what did you think they were doing? I don't like that we are just talking about it. Apparently, one of the writers decided this phenomenon was a great niche topic to exploit during the sex education episode of the series. We're sorry for anyone who made the mistake of watching this episode with their parents. 
But for everyone else, the moment was a hilarious treat that, for better or for worse, became forevermore ingrained in our minds. I'm Marsha Langman, and I'm here to say that sex before marriage is never the way. I waited till marriage and then some to do it. If you decide to sin, you'll rue it. Word. Number six. Tom and Jean Ralphio give a tour of Entertainment 720. This guy just started a business. He's my friend. It would really help him out. Plus, I'm going to oversee everything and make sure it goes great. Okay, Tom, we trust you. As we've established, Tom Haverford has a tendency towards eccentricity, and his business venture slash complete disaster with Jean Ralphio perfectly exemplifies this. Their tour reads like a Dos Equis commercial, except instead of listing off crazy stories from their past, the duo lists off ridiculous activities that Entertainment 720 would help accomplish in the future. Why do we keep our petty cash in a clear plastic toilet bowl? I don't know, maybe because we're flush with cash! Only one reasonable question is asked during the entire tour. Shouldn't you focus on building your client base? And it's answered with a simple no. Tom's flair would eventually work for him. But in this instance, it is unrealistic, unfocused, and ultimately, highly amusing. First you set up the pond, then you reel in the fish. Big D, hit me! Uh-oh, 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 uh-oh! Come on! We're living the dream. Number five, Garth Blunden's Star Wars filibuster. Uh, the Pawnee Charter uh, shall not be changed, not today, not ever! Wow. What would a show about government be without a Mr. Smith Goes to Washington-esque filibuster scene? Garth Blunden, played by Patton Oswalt, doesn't see eye to eye with Leslie regarding some outdated Pawnee laws, and he takes to the city forum to stand up for what he believes in. Given Oswalt's self-proclaimed obsession with Star Wars, he was given free reign to describe his vision for Episode 7 in the nearly nine-minute filibuster scene, which we highly recommend viewing uncut. If he holds the reality gem, that means he can jump from different realities. This will be our link to the Marvel Universe from the Star Wars Universe. Living in a post-Episode 7 world, it looks like his vision wasn't entirely accurate. But fans of both Star Wars and Parks and Rec have much to enjoy in this impressive rant. We're still not sure how the extras behind Garth are not in stitches. After a beat, Luke says, Darth Vader was my father, but Ben Kenobi was my master, and he cuts Hannibal Lecter in half. Mr. Blunden. Number four, Leslie finally meets Joe Biden. Oh, just remembered, I uh, kind of got you an engagement present. Is it a Waffle Tower? I mean, it's a little better than that. Girls growing up in the 80s may have idolized the likes of David Hasselhoff or Harrison Ford, but not Leslie. Her heroes, and at times erotic fantasies, are far more likely to take place on Capitol Hill than the Hollywood Hills. And one silver-haired fox has stood out above the rest of Ms. Nope as the gold standard for men. Welcome. <laughs> You're, my, my, my name just came out of your mouth. Well, yeah, it did. <laughs> well, this isn't happening. Thanks to her dutiful husband, Leslie gets a brief chance to interact with Joe Biden, and viewers get the opportunity to laugh at her bewilderment. She speaks just slightly too loudly and answers just a little too quickly when spoken to. And several seasons of built-up love for Joe pay off in this one hilarious scene. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. You, you're welcome. You don't let anything happen to him, do you understand me? He is precious cargo! Number three, treat yourself. Oh, one, two, one, two! Donatella, T-Mobile. Three words for you, treat yourself. With what is debatably the most quoted adage of the entire series, we are shown that the good life should be accessible to everyone, at least for one day a year. Donna and Tom have chameleonaire tastes on a Costco budget, but for 24 hours, this does not matter to them. Clothes. Treat yourself. Fragrances. Treat yourself. Massages. Treat yourself. Mimosas. Treat yourself. Fine leather goods. Treat yourself. It's the best day of the year. The best day of the year! The prop pieces and outfits brought in for this gag are uproarious and over-the-top hilarious. It's difficult not to feel the characters' glee as they indulge themselves again and again and again. Treat yourself culminating in Ben Wyatt crying in a crime-fighting costume, this episode is, in and of itself, its own special treat. Thank you. I really needed this. <laughs> I got to treat myself. <laughs> Uh-oh, Batman's crying. Number two, snake juice. Please, this is important. I'm launching my new high-end Kahlua-style liqueur. Snake juice. Snake juice is another Tom Haverford Jean Ralphio exclusive, guaranteed to taste great and ensure an even better night. 
It's often hilarious to see friends you've known for quite some time get hammered in a social setting. And here, we get to see these on-screen comrades get wasted on what's basically rat poison. I believe an ounce of that would literally kill me. Sadly, we weren't given a drunk Donna clip, but the others are hysterical and so on point. In particular, Ron Swanson is at his most memorable whenever he does something that's highly un-Swanson. My name is Ron Swanson. In general, I try never to speak with people but I have been drinking this snake juice thing, and it's damn good. You should buy it." Tom, the yin to his yang, helps extract this, allowing us to enjoy the hysteria of the evening while skipping out on the morning after. Is this everybody? Anne took a cab. Tom's in the trunk, Jerry's on the roof. All right, where to first? Your mother's butt. <laughs> <laughs> Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number 1. Ice Walking to the Platform We're a team. We're all going out together. Let's give this crowd a show. Go! 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 The art of the cringe has been mastered in recent years particularly by TV mockumentaries. Creativity is key when it comes to anything, and that's proven when a campaign rally, an ice rink, and a luxurious red carpet that's just a little too short come together to create one of the funniest scenes in Parks and Rec history. I mean, it was a short walk, but it was pretty luxurious, right? Okay. For two minutes, we are barraged with prop pieces, adding to the awkwardness. The three-legged dog, the ironic background music, the stage that's erected far too high… nothing goes horribly wrong, but nothing goes right either. Awkward humor doesn't get much better than this, and it's hard not to feel sorry for these fictional characters who just can't catch a break. Between the gales of laughter, that is. I'm sorry, okay, this is, this is just a disaster, isn't it? This is the, <laughs> this is the worst political event ever in history. Which scenes from the show had you swiveling in your chair with laughter? Let us know in the comments down below. Okay, something is different about my computer. Aha! It's gone! Did you enjoy this video? Check out these other clips from WatchMojo, and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.